Hey guys, and welcome back to this Bible study in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. And somebody's probably going to go, Jason, didn't you preach this message in church today? Yes, I did. Jason, why are you preaching it now in your garage or in my little workshop, as it were? I, I, I got to be honest, I'll, I'll probably post that message for the live version in case somebody wants it. Guys, this topic is so big and so important. I wanted it to be, I wish I would have said at church today for this message because I want it to be that personal. So guys, let's do this. This is you and me. Let's open our Bibles and have a Bible study together in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Let's read that. Let's pray about it. And let's dive into this study. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father God, we God, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, that it reaches Brazil, India, North Carolina, Kentucky, God. Thank you for all those that will tune in, God, to hear this message. God, thank you most of all for your son. Thank you for all that you've done. This Thanksgiving weekend that we've had, God, thank you for leaving us your word, God, so that we can study and become closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I titled the message today at church like A to B, or getting from point A to point B. So we've got a couple of major themes here. So as we started uh, chapter 12, which we did last week, you got to remember, we finished 11 weeks of Hebrews 11, where we went through and we looked at all these saints. We looked at all these people. That's why, that's why chapter 12 starts with a therefore, to make sure you understand this is just the continuation of chapter 11. So it opened up with the therefore, and the moral of the verse was, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run with endurance the race set before us. And so the key theme that we're building in here is this. We're approaching a theme where, guys, all I can say is, we, we live in this American church world, and golly, where we go to church in particular in this area even, there seems to be a, this underlying theme. I think I called a message a couple of weeks ago, sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. And that seems to be the message that's preached in all these churches. And what happens is when life gets tough for people, then we just accuse them as something's wrong with you, or this is your fault, or if you only had enough faith, this wouldn't happen to you. And we've built churches on the concept of for every person leaving the church because they found out it's not sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. And when those people leave church a lot of times, they're just leaving and they're going home. But a lot of these big churches are built on the fact that as these people are leaving, fresh meat is coming into the church. And so these churches are built on this continuous gross negligence to the word of sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. And as quick as some people are leaving, they've figured out, hey, this isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. You've got new ones come in. I, I told my wife last night as we talked about this, I said, I feel like one of the biggest measures of the church is by those who just keep showing up. It's the measure of the church or how a church should be measure, measured I've said before, you don't measure the success of a church by the God or by the number of people. You measure it by godliness of the people in the church. Guys, I'll take it a little further. I think you can measure a church just based on the people who just keep showing up, even though they got bad news, even though there's no sunshine, there's no lollipop, and, and there's no rainbow. And they're just there, weekend and week out, growing closer to the Lord because they understand they're not going to make it on the outside. They're only going to make it as being a part of this church, as being a part of the family of God, and as a family, we'll make it. Guys, that's the measure of a church. <clears throat> that would preach an entire message if we quit right there, right? 
so this this section starts out with like the underlying theme is we close Hebrews 11 with, hey, you know, there were a lot of Old Testament saints. They were sawn in two. They were, these people were beaten with whips. There's a general idea here that we're being prepared for. Life may not be perfect. You may have some really hard struggles ahead. And then this may be the part that gets harder Some of these struggles we face may be prescribed tests that we're placed in by God in order to get us from one place to another. You see, we we start out this Christian walk, but guys, that's why this says it's a race, but it's an endurance race. It's not a sprint. It's like a marathon. The exact word for race is agon or agony in the Greek. And it's where we get that word agony from. And when he says <clears throat> endurance, the word for endurance literally means to remain under. It's like, this is funny. I'm, I'm the one sitting here selling you on this gospel message today where I'm looking at you and I'll be the first one to say, come on in. I remember listening to a preacher one time and he preached. And he was talking to what was probably, there were people there, kids getting abused or beaten by parents. And he was sitting there, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, and you'll never be alone. And he was trying to act like this message was such that the beating would stop. Reality of it is, he should have said, guys, come to Jesus, You'll never be alone, but I cannot say that the beating will stop. A matter of fact, the beatings may get worse because now you profess Christ in your life. For many Christians throughout history, things didn't get better. And the good we see when we read in Romans that God is working all things together for the good for those who love Him. Guys, that good may not even be good that we individually see in our lives, but there's a greater good that God is working that we may not even see the results of till we get to heaven. And so we get this idea that there are prescribed tests in life, things that we're going to go through that God is going to use to grow us into the people He needs us to be. You see, you got saved, and that's the problem. A lot of people have gotten saved, and they're still right there. They're in churches where the Bible isn't taught. They, they've they heard a hundred messages on better finances and a better marriage, but they don't know the Word of God. They've heard people stand up and talk about scriptures and never actually even explain what those scriptures mean because the person talking it didn't even know what the scripture was about in the first place. Um, So we've got this idea that we're entering into a race. And we're going to have, guys, part of the race, part of the time, it's going to be the most amazing, wonderful thing ever. And I feel like maybe that's where I'm coming in this too strong right now. I feel like maybe I did that church day. But I don't want to sell you into believing sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows when the reality of it is you're going to have bad days, bad weeks, bad months, maybe even bad years. But there's a underlying theme that's present in the scripture. And, and nine minutes in, we really do need to move with it. But he says, let us run with endurance. Even though you're going to be under, even though you're going to be under the stream and it's going to feel like the world is against you, it's saying, just keep putting one foot ahead of the next. That's faith. Remember, that's what we've been talking about, faith. Sometimes the greatest act of faith in your life is just getting out of bed. Some of you have been there before. You've been, Guys, I once hit a point in my life about 13 years ago, I laid in bed for three days straight staring at a ceiling. I, I know what that's like. 
And so as we dive into this, we're sitting here looking at it. Sometimes the greatest act of faith is just taking that next step. It's getting out of bed in the morning. It's it's going out and facing a day when there's nothing left inside of you it feels like to face the day. The author here now is saying this, Therefore, look at all those saints in the Old Testament. We also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, guys, these witnesses, these are, some people will say it's lost people watching us. And yeah, that's true. That's fine. There's always lost people watching you. So you need to be, you need to be cautious of how you run the race because of the impact you have on someone else's decision of whether or not they're getting into the race. That's okay preaching. I don't mind that. It's not what the verse is saying. Some people say that the witnesses, that's grandma and grandpa watching you. I said it last week. Guys, when I get to heaven one day, I'm not going to be looking back down at the drama of this world. <clears throat> My kids are going to have to make it on their own. I'll see them when they get to heaven too. And, and then we probably aren't even going to worry about that much of what happened in their lives because we're all going to be rejoicing in a new heaven and a new earth. And so all that to come. So the witnesses here is the fact he's saying, guys, when you're going through the struggle and when you're going through the bad days, the things that may come up ahead in your future, you can look to those in the past that have been through, they've been where you are now. If we go into the Old Testament, we can probably find somebody that's been where you are now. And guys, not just that, there's people in your life that God has placed there. People that have already, they've, they've run their race. People in your personal life, godly men and women that have already ran this race and are standing with Christ now. So now the Bible is saying, or the writer of Hebrews is saying, I want you to look to these witnesses that you're surrounded by. Look to these examples of people who lived and died breathing Jesus saves, that God saves, that God is the only way. And he says, let us, let us wait, lay aside every weight, in ASB, encumbrance. Anything that slows you down or dampens your relationship with God, guys, it's got to go, even if it's a good thing. I, I use for an example at church this morning, I called out people by names, but I was hopefully being kind of funny with it. But there is a reality, guys. I'll even say, what about in your dating life, your personal life? Girls, if you're with a boy that's not got any interest in Christ, you think your walk with Christ is going to get further by you dating him? No. <clears throat> you need to be with somebody in your life that wants to be just as close to Christ as you are. Someone that's keeping you from Christ, they're dead weight. And the Bible says you need to cut them. Guys, it could even be a job. I mean, I heard somebody the other day say, I, I'd like to do more stuff with my kids, but I like spending money too much. So basically you're saying you're, you're choosing money over your kids. You know, I understand some things about having to work and not being there for your kids. My dad drove a truck. He did the only thing he could do to take care of his kids. He didn't have any further options and that took him away from home. But he didn't do it to get rich. He didn't do it to buy new cars and new vehicles and bigger houses and more toys. He did it because it's the only thing he could do. In your life, if you're intentionally doing things and choosing things that take you away from your family and your ability to be a godly dad and a godly mom simply for the purpose of, of you want more bling, more toys, more. Guys, you need to reevaluate your life because that's weight that's coming between you and God. And it's weight that's coming between your kids and God and coming between you and your kids. Put it aside. And he says, let us lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares us. The, there with the sin, if you notice, there's this, Hopefully you're looking at your Bible, unless you're driving. Don't be looking at the Bible if you're driving. But he says, the sin. 
Notice how he's being very explicit here with this definite article, the sin. And we talked about last week, every Bible commentator says that 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 is the sin, is the lack of faith. In other words, in in your life, you still don't have the faith to get you through this trial. You don't have the faith right now. And guys, I get it. I said it this morning at church. I know people personally in my life, they've been through, and I'll use this word again, they've been through what most people would say is hell, even though I'm reluctant to use that word for that expression. But they've been through so much at this point. But you know what the sin is? And I said it this morning at church. I think the sin goes beyond just faith. I think the sin is, is you've got too small a view of who God is. And I think that's most Christians walking around today. They have very big views of themselves and very small views of God. Guys, you won't get it straight. You won't get it right until you understand just how big God is. Uh, It was my son a year ago. When I asked him, like, how this works, how big is God and how big is my eight-year-old son, like to try and get this comparison. My eight-year-old got it more right than a lot of people I know that say they've been saved a long time. My eight-year-old son goes, I'm dirt. I'm nothing. Guys, that's a view of God that will get you somewhere in life. Because when you start viewing God as this huge God, and you start bringing yourself down as low as you can get, This big God is the God that can handle today. Faith in this God is the God that can get you through whatever it is you're going through right now. And notice what he says in verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Can't say it any better. Guys, when you put your eyes up on a big God you can begin to get through things by faith. Why is that? Because the Bible says here that he's the author of faith. In other words, all faith started with Christ Jesus. And he's the perfecter, the the finisher, the completion of faith. He completed what faith is by definition on the cross. And he did it for the joy that was set before him. That's my Jesus. That is my Jesus. He he did everything he did. So many people now, they only want to be saved because it feels like they were given an alternative between heaven and hell. Of course, Jesus wasn't going to hell. But for Jesus, it wasn't just about just clear this hurdle. Just do this one thing. Just check this box. For Jesus, it was all about Dad, what do I need to do? And what can I do, Dad? He did it all for obedience. And guys, what more does any parent want out of their son? It's just obedience. Jesus did what he did just for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He despising the shame. And now he sat down at the right hand of God. Here he is, God himself, beaten till his skin's coming off his body, nailed to a cross. I I told everybody at church today, I I just did, I was play Jesus for an Easter play back for a bunch of years at my old church. My back from that cross is still messed up today because of it. And that was a play And that was acting. What he experienced in a fleshly body, even though I hurt as I bend over, I can't even in the smallest part of me begin to grasp what it was like for him to go through what he went through. To be upon that cross, children throwing dung at you, the soldiers urinating on him. Jason, how do you know that? Because that's what they did when people were on the cross. The cross wasn't 
way up in the air. They put it down low explicitly for that purpose. <laughs> he became low so that he could save us. And he sat down at the right hand of God. When it says he sat down, that means the work is over, guys. That means there's nothing else you can add to this. Even though so many of you are in churches today that are adding, what's that, God? What's that, God? Okay, God, I'll tell them, God. What? You've got junk like that going on in churches. Even though Hebrews start out, this God who's once and for all spoken through his son, Jesus Christ, the work is over. The gospel message is clear. <laughs> Hell is hot. Heaven's sweet. Sin's black and white. Judgment is real. And Jesus saves. At some point, you've got to make a decision where you're at in this whole thing. Despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand. And by sitting at the right hand, that means he's got all the power that God has. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against themselves, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So I know you're going through some bad things. But pause for a second and think of what he went through for you. Verse 4, because you have not resisted the bloodshed, striving against sin. Okay, I, I, I know there's things going on. And for some of you, you've given up things to be a Christian. You've been even made fun of. There's been things happen. But you haven't been as far as he has yet. So before you begin to give up, and as you struggle in faith, look back upon this one who authored faith and who completed faith upon that cross. And now this is where we get to something that's kind of hard to grasp. And that's in verse number five. And that's the idea that sometimes being a parent is tough. I know we always tell kids this. It's like, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. Well, God says in Isaiah 63, 9, in all their affliction, he was inflicted. In other words, God gets no delight out of punishing someone. God gets no delight out of sending someone to hell even. It's not the way God works. But the reality of it is, we see a theme here that a parent that loves is a parent that disciplines. And so the whole key to the rest of these verses through verse 11 is the fact that God disciplines his children. And where we get hung up, I get hung up because I'm in a new King James Bible and it keeps throwing this word chastening out. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. So let's get past that language. If you're in NASB, roll with that one because it's going to be much easier to understand with this. But it still doesn't do it right. The rest of this chapter, the theme, or not chapter, but this section, the rest of this theme is about God's discipline in your life. And the word for discipline, it comes from padia or pious for child. And what this has got everything to do with is everything that a parent does. It's not just the spankings. This is everything that encompasses what a parent does so as to get a child from point A to point B. And guys, that's that's exactly everything that's going on here. And unfortunately, the sad truth is this. Sometimes in getting from point A to point B, there's pain involved in that process. Sometimes getting from point A to point B is not easy. Uh, because like we've, we've used the reference before and again, this... Sometimes you got to go through hell. Sometimes there's going to be little parts of life that are going to be tearing you apart to try and get through. 
you're going to suffer. I know, I know, remember? I know the other churches are preaching sunshine, ha- sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. Guys, we've already broken that down. Sometimes even through God himself, you're going to go through things that test you and grow you and direct you because here's the thing. God didn't just save you to leave you where you're at. The worst thing in the world is to be in the church that doesn't teach the Bible and you've been in it six or seven years and you're stagnant and you've never gotten anywhere. So we've got this idea is, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Do not despise the discipline of the Lord. In other words, whatever it is that God is doing in your life to get you where you need to be, That's what we need to focus on here. God's going to do what God has to do to get you where you need to be in life. And not everything that has to do with that is going to be pleasant. You can go ahead, strap up, put on the armor, as God himself says, and get ready for what comes ahead. But the thing is, there's a purpose in this. God knows the person. He already sees you as this person. And God is going to get you from this point A to point B. Uh, J. Vernon McGee told the story. Because this is the problem with some Christians. J. Vernon McGee told the story of a little girl that fell out of bed. And when she came crying to her dad, her dad said, You know what the problem is? You stayed too close to where you got in. That's the struggle with a lot of Christians. You're too close to where you've got in. The goal is this is a marathon, this is a race, and it's not going to be easy, and it's going to take a lot of faith, and it's going to take you putting your eyes and holding them on to a very big God to get you where you need to be. To get out of bed tomorrow morning, you may need to have your eyes on a very big God because God is working like a parent in your path to get you to where you need to be. And that means sometimes, sometimes there's going to be punishment. Sometimes things are going to happen because any parent that loves their child, sometimes there's going to be a whooping. Sometimes things are going to be just straight out. You've sinned in your life. And now we always say this around my house. Sin has consequences. Bottom line, sin has consequences. Sometimes there's punishment. Sometimes there's things we don't see as punishment, but what we don't understand is God's doing some things just to guide us. I told my wife last night, it's like there's two paths, <laughs> two paths, the verge in the woods. I took the one lesser traveled by. You know the neat thing for a Christian? God's going to block one of those paths. Sometimes God shuts down the path. Sometimes we don't get the promotion we need because that promotion is going to take us farther away from God. Sometimes things happen in our lives to keep us from going one way or the other because God needs us to go a certain direction. And in the process of that, for us, in the meantime, it's painful and it's bad. But what we don't understand is what God is working, again, working for the good, just may not be good that we see. Here's an angry chicken behind me right now. <laughs> but guys, here's another thing. Sometimes God is working things in our life as well because we just don't see how big God is yet. And sometimes we go through trials and we go through tests and we go through these moments in which God is literally working in our lives to help us see just how big God is. Because until we see God as God, until we see God as God, guys, it's it's really hard to get where we need to be in life. So God's working all these things. God is guiding, and that's God's discipline. So he opens verse 5, and he says, Have you forgotten the exhortation? This is literally going back and saying, when you enter into these moments, when you enter into these hardships, when you enter into these tests in life, 
some of the tests even prescribed by God. When you enter into these moments, though, have you forgotten the exhortation? What's that mean? It means open your Bible, turn to page one. In my case, then, read everything through page 1,937. Everything that comes before this, he's now saying when things get bad, you need to go back to the book. You need to go back to the source of life. You need to go back to the Word of God. When I left my church, when when I first left the first church I was at, I was saved in that church. When we left, man, we left. We had to cut ties. I preached the message, walked out the door, and I walked out of that church. And in the process of doing it, I left friends behind. I left people I love behind. But we had to leave. And I was ripped, and my wife was ripped. And it's probably why I'm very good at talking about church hurt with people. And I called my former pastor that I was saved under. And he told me, I asked what I need to do. He said, you need to be like Elijah. You need to get back to the brook. You need to get back to the word. And you need to pour yourself into it. And guys, that's exactly what I did. I dove into the Word. And my wife said at church this morning, I was like a man on fire. Because the more I learned, the more I grew, the more I began to understand, and the more I was able to start to help other people as they went through what they went through in life. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Do not despise, again, NASB everything here is so much better. Do not take lightly. Do not regard lightly. It means when you're going through a hard time, pause and be like, God, what is it that you're wanting me to get out of this? Don't be, I know it's our tendency to question God. Why, God? Why is this happening? But instead of asking why, maybe it would be better if we say, God, how are you going to grow me through this? What direction are you going to send me? God, how are you going to use this through my life to help somebody else that's lost and hurting and dying in this world so that I can bring them from the paths of sin? And bring them to you. Nor be discouraged. The word discouraged means to faint. To be paralyzed. It means when you're going through the situation. And it feels like all you can do is stop. Don't stop. Just keep putting one foot in front of the others. That's why we're in the family of God. And we're in this together. We've read it over and over through the Bible. When you go down, I'm coming there with you. The one thing I've promised people now is you're not going to be alone because if you're my brother, if you're my sister, when you start to fall, guys, I'm jumping in. I'm jumping in because you're important to me. If you need me at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning, I may be asleep. I may drink a lot of coffee. I'll be there. I'll be there because, man, we ain't leaving anybody behind. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. What's he trying to say here? Very simple. I'm summarizing. I'm 34 minute marks here and I'm trying to tie everything together. Why does God allow us to go through some of the things that we go through? Because He loves us and because we're sons. A very common theme is this. It's kind of funny when we're all out in public and we see we see kids misbehaving. We feel like it's our, like, we feel like this goal, like, oh, if I could just have a few minutes with that kid, I'll go get a switch off my switch tree. Literally, I've got a perfect wild cherry tree. It's right over there. Um, My sons will probably chop it down one day when they get old enough. Jason, that sounds pretty rough. 
here's what I know. Proverbs thirteen twenty four. He who spares his rod hates his son. He who loves his son disciplines accordingly. That means you don't punish for the sake of punishing. But when your child needs to be punished, you punish that child. A father's love for his child dictates that the father, and you notice how I keep stressing father here. Can I get a little closer, amen? That there's a demand for the father to act like a father. And when a child is going off the course, then a father is responsible to put that child on course. Well, I'm too busy. I, I can't be there for my... Then you need to lose some weight from your life and get your child back on course because that's your responsibility, Pop. You with me so far? Say amen. Oh, you like that verse? How about Proverbs 29, 15? A rod and a rebuke. <laughs> a rod and a rebuke bring wisdom. A child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. You're not doing a child any favor by by letting that child do whatever they want. Look at what we see here. For whom the Lord loves, you notice this. When you're going through something, when you're going through something, it proves that God loves you and it proves that you belong to Him. It proves that you are a son. Because here's the thing. A father only punishes his son. I can't punish somebody else's son. My boys, my boys I take care of because they're my boys. When God loves somebody, when you belong to God, you may have to go through some things, but that's because you belong to God. And I know that's hard to see when you're in the midst of when you're in the midst of everything coming unglued around you. It's hard to see that. But God is with you, and you belong to Him, and He loves you. And one of the biggest things we see all the time is you have people that you're doing everything right, and you're going through this stuff, and you look over, and you see your neighbor lost as a ball in high weeds, as Brother Roger from church would say, and you see your neighbor, and they got what looks like it all, man. Like, everything's going right for them. And you look over and you're like, but I'm the one doing everything right. God, I'm the one living for you. And you're the one God is moving from point A to point B. You're right. God's, God's, not, God's, not, discipline, God's not disciplining them. Well, God, why are you not disciplining them? I have liberty to quote King James. King James says they're a bastard and not a son. Language wasn't as strong when it was written, but now it actually helps us to understand it more. God's not disciplining that person because they don't belong to Him. That person is as close to heaven as they're ever getting. And when things unravel, and here's the thing, it will unravel because one thing we know for sure is Every single person is going to one day face death. And when things unravel for that person, oh, they're going to unravel. If you wonder why I get silence, because I've seen lost people face death before. And it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. When there's no hope, and you see the look in somebody's eyes that realize they've got as close to heaven as they're going to get, and now all they're left with is their spite and their hate, and that's what they're carrying with them. Don't base your faith upon what's going on in that person's life. You may be going through hell right now, but God's working something in you and God's guiding you and God's directing you and whatever it is that you're going through, 
Jesus went through infinitely more when he was on the cross. Because one thing we see for certain, if you belong to God, you're going to go through some things. You're going to go through some trials. You're going to go through some tests. And we are, we're at 40 minutes. We're on track to finish this. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us. Failure to discipline your kids is a failure to love your kids. When you let kids do whatever they want, when you, I've said it over and over, the worst judgment in the world, Daddy, can I go play in the street? Do whatever you want, son. The worst judgment in the world is to let your kids do whatever they want. It says here, when we had human fathers who corrected us, we paid them respect. I've been in school for 25 years. I can tell you one thing. Kids who have parents who let them do whatever they want and offer those kids no discipline, they also have no respect for those parents. Those kids treat their parents like doormats. And those parents are only good for what they can give to their children. They don't do anything out of obedience. They don't do anything out of love. But we see a precedence here. When we had human fathers who corrected us, we gave them respect. Now he says, now I want you to think about God. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Guys, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 21, go read it. A disobedient child could be stoned to death. So now he's simply saying this. Look at what the world is. Look at what's going on in the world. If you had a human father that loved you, now even though you're going through what you're going through, you've got the evidence that God is watching over you. God is working something through you. And through this evidence, there is your life before you. Because for you, it's moving from point A to point B. For indeed, for a few days, for they indeed, for a few days, chastened us, they disciplined us, it seemed best to them. Guys, as earthly parents, we just do our best. There's been some times I can say I flew off the handle and I misjudged the situation. I could tell you the son about my I could tell you the story about my son trying to give a chicken a haircut. I misjudged it. So human parents, we do the best that we can. But now finish that verse. But he for our profit that he may be that we may be partakers in his holiness. God disciplines us in our lives. God straightens us. God guides us from point A to point B because he wants us to be where he is. I told somebody on my physics YouTube the other day, somebody made a comment like, I was a good teacher or something. Thank you for that kind of stuff. My role in teaching physics was always this. I wanted you to come to where I am. I was going to do whatever was necessary to bring you to me. Guys, that's our Father in heaven. The things we go through now are all the things He's doing to bring us closer to Him and to ultimately bring us to Christ's likeness and home with Him. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. There are people in my church hurting today. There are people whom I love hurting today. And these things, they may not be joyful. In fact, they're painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We always say if you're going through hell, you just keep going. I've already said it in this video today that the biggest act of faith sometimes is just getting out of bed. 
and you saying, God, I can't get out of bed if you're not with me. God, I can't face today if you're not with me. But there's a promise. Maybe a day, it may be a month, it may be a year. It may be years. There may be some things you carry with you the rest of your life. But God's making a promise. One day I'm going to get you through this. And guys, I'll be the one to say it. Sometimes the speed that we get through, that's kind of on us. Are we doing what we need to be doing? Are we going back to the Word? Are we spending our time? Are we focusing on God or are we focusing on our problems? Here's the thing you need to think about. At the beginning of this, he said to focus on those witnesses, to look at those witnesses. You see the same God that took Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego out of the fire is the same God with you today. The same God that shut the lion's mouth is the same God with you today. The same God that brought the walls of Jericho down is the same God that's with you today. Hey, there's a promise being made. And I know it's rough and I know it hurts. But God is trying to bring you. He's trying to bring you closer to Him. And you're going to hurt and you're going to have these bad days and you're going to have all these things happen. And God is trying to pull you in closer and train you up. Why would God try and train me up? Because nothing's for a loss. Nothing's for a loss so long as you use that to bring somebody else closer to God. Use your story to see someone saved. See someone. Use your story to change a life. Guys, I promise, you don't have to look very hard and you'll find somebody hurting. Somebody that doesn't know God the way you know God. When you've made it through to the other side, now it's your turn to turn around and help somebody else along their way. You take what God has done to you and God has done for you and you reach out and you help that person. You lift them up. They may not even know God as Savior. And when they look to you, one day they may say, I want what you got. How did you make it through? When you lost your husband, how did you make it through? When you lost your job, how did you make it through? When you... When you had to face cancer, how did you make it through? I'm closing this message. Guys, if you've stuck this out for 48 minutes, I absolutely love you. I absolutely appreciate you. I'm absolutely going to be praying for you. You leave me a comment. I'll write your name down and I'll be praying for you. I love each one of you so much. I don't know where you are but I'm praying for you to get through where you're going and I make you a promise. You're not going to be alone. Hey guys, this is Jason. I love y'all. I hope y'all have a blessed week. Thank you for 48 minutes of this. If you ever need me, holler at your boy. Hit me on the comment. For those of you that know me in real life, email me, let me know. Guys, I love you. Have a great week this week. Bye.